This is nodular fasciitis. It is a benign spindle cell proliferation that commonly presents as a solitary and rapidly growing mass, usually in the upper extremities of young adults, although it may occur at any age. It may also present in the trunk or in the head and neck, but it usually does not involve the hands and feet. As the name suggests, nodular fasciitis usually arises from fascia, and it may grow in three different patterns, either up into the overlying subcutis, down into the underlying skeletal muscle, or alternatively, horizontally along the fascia. Rare cases, usually from the head and neck, may actually arise in the dermis and not involve the subcutis, fascia, or deeper structures. Both the subcutaneous and intramuscular types of nodular fasciitis are very well circumscribed, just like you can see in this example. In contrast, the fascial type of nodular fasciitis usually appears more linear or stellate as it tracks along the fascia and the overlying subcutaneous septa. One very important diagnostic point, even at low power for nodular fasciitis, is its small size. The vast majority of these lesions are smaller than 3 centimeters. And in fact, the example that you see here is about 2 centimeters in diameter. Some authors have recommended using great caution before rendering a diagnosis of nodular fasciitis in a lesion that is much larger than 3 centimeters. From low power, nodular fasciitis usually has a sort of heterogeneous appearance, with some areas being more hypercellular and more fibrous in the background, and other areas being more hypocellular with more of a mixoid background. And I find that one of the most useful diagnostic clues, even from a 2x magnification, as in this case, is the presence of these small pockets of mixoid or mucinous cystic degeneration that you can see. And as we look around at other areas of the tumor, you can again appreciate these small pockets of breakdown with a mixoid substance, uh, which is probably hyaluronic acid or other ground substance. And here you can see another focus of that. This is a very useful clue for nodular fasciitis. Moving around the periphery of the lesion, you can appreciate this thick fibrous layer. And this is actually compressed fascia from which the proliferation is arising, thus the name nodular fasciitis. And you can see here, some skeletal muscle bundles on the other side of the fascia. So this lesion was probably pushing up from the fascia into the overlying subcutis. At higher power, you can appreciate that the lesion is composed of spindle cells that are arranged in short fascicles in many areas. But as you look around at the other areas that are more hypocellular, you can appreciate a background that's very mixoid, as well as some dense, hyalinized collagen bundles. Focally, more feathery or tissue culture-like areas, such as seen here, can be appreciated. And this is a classically described feature of nodular fasciitis. Here's a closer look at the so-called tissue culture areas. You can appreciate that the cells are a little more stellate and less spindled. They have very plump nuclei, and they are arranged haphazardly and not in well-organized short fascicles, as you see elsewhere in the proliferation. From this power, you can also appreciate extravasated erythrocytes, or red blood cells, a common finding in nodular fasciitis. Here's a high power view of the cells. You can see that they have very bland nuclei with open chromatin and punctate nucleoli. And you do not appreciate very much uh, nuclear atypia or hyperchromasia, as you would see in a sarcoma. The cells that comprise nodular fasciitis are actually plump myofibroblasts. And you can appreciate that each cell around the nucleus has a purple cytoplasm that extends from each end of the nucleus. You can appreciate it down here as well, and also in this cell right here. I think the presence of, of a bluish or purplish cytoplasm in a spindle cell helps you to distinguish a fibroblast or myofibroblast, which have that color cytoplasm, from a smooth muscle cell, which has a bright pink cytoplasm. Occasionally, one will come across cells like this, that appear to have a very large hyperchromatic and atypical nucleus. And these cells, if not recognized appropriately, can cause real concern to the pathologist. But what this actually is, is an atrophic skeletal muscle cell. And if you look a little closer, it may not show up perfectly in the video, but you can appreciate that rather than one large pleomorphic nucleus, what we have here are multiple small round nuclei that are crunched together, surrounded by some pink cytoplasm. So that's what an atrophic skeletal muscle uh, bundle looks like. And this little skeletal muscle bundle probably got trapped up in the middle of the fasciitis as it was rapidly growing. So it's important to not confuse that with nuclear pleomorphism. Again, look at the surrounding spindle cells and appreciate that there's a very bland nuclear appearance.
And although the cells are plump and a bit large, they lack hyperchromasia and pleomorphism. Mitotic activity, on the other hand, is quite common in nodular fasciitis. And in some cases, it may be quite brisk. You can see a mitotic figure right here. Although there may be many mitoses, atypical or abnormal mitotic figures are not usually identified. Here's a closer look at some of those cystic myxoid areas that we could appreciate from low power. And you can see that what's happening here is that the lesional cells are kind of falling apart and breaking down. There's bluish mucinous or myxoid material that's filling up the space. Out to the periphery of these areas, you sometimes see these dense pink hyalinized collagen bundles, or so-called keloidal collagen bundles. And that's a common feature in nodular fasciitis. Here's a closer view at a smaller area of myxoid cystic degeneration. You can see that the cells are becoming feathery and falling apart. And again, there's that bluish mucin or myxoid material that fills up the spaces. Sometimes you can see multinucleated osteoclastic giant cells adjacent to these cystic areas as well. Now let's take a look at another example of nodular fasciitis and see if what I just taught you holds true. Here on the left hand side you can see the fasciitis itself and on the right hand side you can see mature adipose tissue or fat and that's the subcutis. Looking into the center of the lesion you can appreciate right away that it's a heterogeneous proliferation with more cellular areas in the lower portion and then less cellular areas with a more myxoid or bluish pale background up here in the top portion of the screen. And even from this very low power you can already appreciate these small areas of cystic myxoid degeneration. Again a very useful diagnostic clue for nodular fasciitis. And there are more areas of cystic change in the center of the screen here. You can also see some extravasated red blood cells. Here's a closer look at the cystic myxoid degeneration, and here's another small pool of, of mucin here where the cells are falling apart. And off to the side, you can appreciate here more of that tissue culture area where the cells are very feathery and sheet-like. And here are the extravasated erythrocytes. These are the keloidal collagen bundles. They're similar to the kind of collagen that you see in keloidal scars, and that's why they're named that way. And they're very prominent in this uh, particular example of nodular fasciitis. And in the more cellular areas, you can appreciate that the cells are arranged in more of a short uh, fascicular pattern rather than a tissue culture arrangement. And at high power, you see again that these are plump myofibroblasts with a purplish cytoplasm on each end of the nucleus, and mitotic figures are readily seen. Here's yet another example. And in this one, you can see that we are clearly in the dermis. This is the dermis, and here's the overlying epidermis. And down at the deep dermis, you have the very superficial portion of a nodular fasciitis. Even from low power, you can already appreciate the diagnosis. You see hypercellular and less cellular areas. You see myxoid cystic degeneration. You can appreciate even from here that these are probably those feathery tissue culture areas of myofibroblasts that we can see at higher power. And I wanted to show this particular example for a couple of reasons. For one thing, the cystic areas can become quite large, and actually you can have large cystic spaces in the middle of nodular fasciitis, so don't let that dissuade you from the diagnosis necessarily. Additionally, some areas of fasciitis can actually become very sclerotic with dense pink collagen and very low cellularity. You can see that here better on higher power where you have dense sclerotic collagen adjacent to myxoid cystic degeneration, and there are very few spindle cells present. And at high power, once again, you can appreciate that mitotic figures are seen, but there's no significant nuclear atypia, hyperchromasia, or pleomorphism. And here's one final example of nodular fasciitis. This one's nice because you can see this dense pink layer here at the edge of the proliferation. This is fascia, and from the fascia, the nodular fasciitis is arising. Again, you can appreciate the myxoid cystic breakdown. I've told you this is a really useful finding, and I think we've seen it in every example we've looked at today. And this case is nice because you can see that the background is very pink and fibrotic compared to the other lesions that I've shown you. Here at higher power you can see that there's a very collagenous background and again these dense keloidal collagen bundles and again the small myxoid cystic spaces and abundant extravasated erythrocytes. I just want to say a quick word about immunohistochemistry for nodular fasciitis. 
Because these are myofibroblasts, they express smooth muscle actin. And the classic pattern of staining is the so-called tram track or train track pattern that you can see here. And what this is is the subplasma membrane region of the myofibroblast highlights with uh, smooth muscle actin, and it gives this parallel line arrangement. And this is because myofibroblasts have a congregation of actin filaments just beneath the plasma membrane, and that's what enables them to uh, readjust their shape and contract, allowing them to perform the normal processes they have in the human body, such as scar formation and wound healing. And here's another picture where you can appreciate that more fully. Uh, that said, I think that most cases of nodular fasciitis are usually pretty easy to diagnose histologically once one's familiar with the histologic features, and immunohistochemistry is not typically needed. Historically, nodular fasciitis has been regarded as a reactive proliferation of myofibroblasts, but more recent data has suggested that these proliferations may actually be transient self-limited neoplasms or actual tumors that are benign. The reason for this is that a recent study in 2011 identified the presence of translocation 1722 resulting in a fusion of the USP6 gene to the MYH9 gene. And this translocation was discovered in the majority of nodular fasciitis that were tested. So this is an interesting and new finding that suggests that maybe this is actually a tumor, a transient neoplasm of myofibroblasts rather than a reactive proliferation as has been thought for so many years. So in summary, I think that nodular fasciitis is one of the more important soft tissue lesions for pathologists to be very familiar with. And this is because it's relatively common and because in some cases it's very cellular, grows rapidly and has abundant mitoses, it can easily be mistaken for a sarcoma. Other entities with which it may be confused are myxoma, fibrous histiocytoma, or fibromatosis. And I'll mention briefly that there are actually several variants of nodular fasciitis. Uh, and I won't really go into the details here, but I just want you to be aware of them. Ossifying fasciitis is similar to nodular fasciitis, but actually has areas of bone formation or metaplastic ossification. Intravascular fasciitis is another example of fasciitis, and it's unique for the fact that it grows into the lumen of blood vessels, including arteries. And this can be very disturbing to the pathologist viewing the case because it simulates intravascular invasion. But regardless of the intravascular growth, these are still benign lesions. Cranial fasciitis is another form of fasciitis that occurs on the scalp of infants. It involves the soft tissue and often erodes into the underlying bone of the skull and may sometimes even erode through the skull. And obviously that clinical scenario is very concerning for malignancy from a clinical perspective. And then finally, proliferative fasciitis and other related entities are distinguished from nodular fasciitis by the presence of large ganglion-like cells that these can look quite atypical and can really cause concern for malignancy. And that entity is outside the scope of this video, but may be a topic for future teaching videos. But if there's one thing that you take away from this video today about nodular fasciitis, I would like you to remember that the presence of myxoid cystic degeneration is one of the most useful clues for the diagnosis.